the dollar plays an important uh, factor in everything. So you better check this, make sure that it is what you want it to be. Right. Mm. So that's a you know that's a warning to you. And what is the other twenty five percent? What's the other twenty percent? Fifteen percent? You know, thirty percent. That's why the most high said build you plant you vineyards. And gardens, know what you're getting. Know what you're getting. Yes, uh, Sister Don. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. Um, this happened a little while ago, but it's relevant to now. Um, even though um, our family considers ourselves vegans, um, the Chinese people, with all of their ingenuity, have managed to take sewage and sterilize it, if you will, compound it and make it into a meat substitute that can be flavored. They can take human excrement, the stuff that comes out of the sewer, and they clean it, strip it, season it, and make it a vegan meat substitute. And yes, our labels are supposed to tell us exactly what we're eating, but who's to say where they get that stuff from? They could call it anything. It's from the human body. They could say it's natural. So even being a vegan, it ain't no guarantee that you eat healthy because you always say that our food would be equivalent to dung. And obviously it literally is. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I mean, we can't escape it because the Most High has already uh, instituted. And why? Because of our own disobedience. Our own disobedience. And speaking of, you know, uh, the Chinese, how many, uh, how many of you, and raise your hand, like Chinese food? Uh-huh, I knew all these hands were going to go up. Well, you have to, you have to be aware of what you're eating. Because the chicken chow mein may be cat chow mein. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You know, I'm not joking. Yes, sir. It might be real. I mean, it, it might be cat, might be dog, it might be monkey, it might be snake, it might be all the detestable things that you, uh, and abominable things that you cannot eat. Now, I don't expect you to believe me, but I have checked these things, I have researched these things, and things are not hidden. They are not hidden. When you watched the Bruce Lee movie, you saw him eating that little thing, you said, what is that he's eating on that, on that stick? Look like a squirrel, or look like a rat, or look like a cat. That's what it was. Because over in China, they throw away nothing. If you go, if you get, if you watch some of these uh, international travel shows, you will see in the markets of China, Taiwan, uh, any, uh, any place over in the east you may see a dog hanging up on the rack you may see a monkey hanging up in the rack in fact there's one delicacy in China that they serve those that could pay five, six hundred dollars for it or a thousand dollars for it is a monkey with his head the top of his head sawed off and you eat in you dig in there and he's brain yes sir I mean, you have to be circumspect of what you eat. When my school, when I had my school next to a Chinese restaurant, we had to close the doors in the summertime for the obnoxious smell that come up out of that place, right next door to it. And I said, man, what are people eating in there? And they would have their own trucks bringing in the food on a daily basis or weekly basis. So I'm not just saying stuff that's going out over the air to who knows who, because this is a world internet. People in China, Taiwan, Okinawa, whatever, if they got capabilities, they can listen to every word that I'm saying. And I'm from the house of Israel. I am Zekiah Israel. So if I'm lying, sue me. 
But my people have to know exactly what they're eating. And it's their choice. If they like your little monkey feet, you know, hey, it's their choice. If they like your monkey brains, it's their choice. If they like the little rat, it's their choice. But you never know what you're eating when you're eating in those places. And my sister, when she said they can make it look like, have the texture like, and even taste like meat, they do it all the time. All the time. They are experts at making cats taste like chicken, making dogs taste like beef. They're experts at it. So, you know, yes, sir. Mm hmm. Yes, sir. To give it a flavor. That's right. I mean, you know, hey, no matter, when the Almighty gave us a special diet, he meant for us to speak, uh, to uh, stay strictly to that diet. Because our enemies plot against you, and they will feed you anything that you will eat. They will feed it to you. Yes, sir, my friend. So is he. That's right. Yeah. Uh -huh. Your man convinces you that you're eating clean. Right. And not getting anything. That's right. And in fact, eating all the ab abomination, who knows? That may be the cause of your cancer. That may be cause of your high blood pressure. That may be cause of your uh, going blind. You know, your sugar diabetes and all other types of illnesses and disease that we uh, have in the black community. But we like to sit down and we like to, you know, uh, partake in these so-called delicacies as much as we can. We'll, uh, like the old folks say, go gorge ourselves off of it. We'll eat it until it runs out of the ears, nose, and everything else. And just eat and feel Yes, sir. My brother. I like brother to give Roy. all the praise and glory to the Alba Sin. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Uh, I just want to go to, actually, we have a vaccination sheet here for anyone that uh, wants to uh, uh, do not allow their children to take vaccinations. And um, I guess the reason why I'm bringing that up, I want my son to stand up for us. So stand up, son. And the reason why I'm having him stand up because at the time he's about 19 now, but Around 2001, when I came in his knowledge, he was having issues with lead, and we know, you know, something was wrong. So at the time when we found out about the, I found out about the vaccination, I stopped him getting vaccinations. <laughs> but at any rate, um, those vaccinations, like we're saying, could be filled with lead, and we don't know what those vaccinations are poison that those vaccinations get. Well, he hasn't had a vaccination since like 2000, so I came to his knowledge 2001. We stopped that. And you can see how healthy and how strong this young man that looks right now without no vaccinations. So I'm just wanting everybody to realize that, you know, we do have a vaccination form that you can fill out, and they do, the, the uh, schools do accept them. So you don't have to have your children take them. As long as they get nourished properly, the proper nourishment, they don't need those vaccinations. Because those vaccinations is nothing or nothing but putting the poison in them. Right. And my son had a high lead level. Now, after we tested him, like in 2002, 2003, the lead level was gone. Right. They were saying he was eating lead out of the, uh, off the walls of the, the wall. paint yeah. and all that. And yeah. We knew he was, you know, so we stopped that. It was, you know, so just and uh, add on to the Moringa. There is, I know before Maurice passed away, there's a doctor named Dr. A out of Boston. I'll be getting my Moringa from there. It's green. I don't know, if the, but it's green. I've been taking it for the most part on the regular. And it you know, keeps me about uh, we may need to check on that, but she has, I think, pretty pure hit the ring. I mean, the purest form she can get because uh, it's grain and uh, it's a powder form. I've been taking for like super form of release your past, so that's been two years. So, you know, I, we still can check on that, though. I check, you know, we can check on that, do the research on that. The grain, okay, the grain, right, the grain, right, yeah, the grain, yeah. So, I do want to say, but uh, the grain moringa is good for you, you know what I'm saying? It's vitality, everything. It's a pretty, pretty good herb. 
Uh, I'm not going to keep talking more because I can add on to the Chinese stuff, but I do want to mention, like, during 1990, I don't want to tell my age, but I was in, D I was in Washington, D.C., and at the time, I was ignorant to that, and I was telling my nephew, let's go to eat Chinese, and he's like, no, nah, you don't want to go, you know, Chinese, they shutting them down for that simple fact. They was killing dogs and cats in the neighborhoods, and they was feeding them to it. And you can, like, if you, if anybody that do eat Chinese food and they try the chicken and see it don't taste like, well, you are, that gives you, that throws a red flag up right there, knowing that, you know, that's not chicken. Like, the more recent, and my name is Royal Yehuda Ben Israel, so 19, 1664 California Avenue, I'm bringing it out too to the world so they know. Praise Yah. Hallelujah. Well, we have to realize that this is part of, uh, of other people's cult customs, part of their culture. This is not a part of our culture. If we stick to our own culture, we adopted the white man's culture in, in, when we was enslaved. You know, being fed the worst parts of the pig, if there is a worst part, and everything else that was detestable, just in order to survive. When we are beyond that now. We are beyond that. We have to get back to what the Most High uh, prescribed for us. But these are other people's culture. These are their customs, and they do not hide it when you investigate it. They do not hide it. Now, the problem is here in America, because everything is big bucks, you know, they might not want you to see that, you know, in the back in the kitchen, that little thing that you thought was chicken, you know, with four legs and all of that, you know, that they're cutting up, and it's no more than a, a cat or a dog or rat or something. They don't want you to see that, but you go to China, you go to Taiwan, you go out of the country, and you'll see. And, yes, my sister. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. Right. Yep. Yep. You're absolutely right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, probably not. You know, something you have to think about. It's probably not. But uh, let's move on there if there's not any more current events. Okay. Let's uh, look at our subject matter for this afternoon. And it is humility and humbleness. Humility and humbleness. In Psalms 25, verse 9, the psalmist states that Yah will teach the meek in his way and guide in judgment. First of all, do we understand what humble and meekness is? Or do we understand what the, the definition of being humble is? Humble and meekness. Does anyone want to explain what the definition of being humble is? Yes, sir, Ariel. And then Sister Elam. Yes, sir. Okay. Good. Good. Sister Elam. Okay, anybody, everybody agree? Anyone disagree? Okay, great. Yes, sir. Those that submit. All oh, right. <laughs> right. You're not the meek. And humble, to be humble, just simply means meekness. 
and humility. They both is the same. So we're going to talk about, uh, we'll go back to Psalms 25 when it says in verse 9 that the psalmist states that Yah will teach the meek in his way and guide in judgment. Does anyone want to make a comment on that? Yes, sir. Uh, brother. Brother, yes. Well, it says the meek he will guide in judgment. And the meek he will teach his way. If you're not meek, you, you basically think you know it all. You know, you got your mind closed up. You're not going to learn. When someone comes to you with anybody's word, even the most high's words, like, nah, I don't mean that. That's more dancing. Nah, I don't mean that. You know, you'll be puffed up. You're, you're not going to be open to learning something. Praise God. Hallelujah. So when the most, so why did the most high say that, uh, why does it say that the most high, he will guide the meek. That's being exclusive there. It's not including somebody who is not meek or who is not humble. It's not including the, the proud, the haughty, the arrogant. So it's not including them. Yes, sir. Yes. A liar. That's right. Right, right, and 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 the halt, the halt, the haughty and the prideful, although he may see it a hundred times, he may still resist it. He may still talk against it, teach against it. He may still ignore it. It's not unlike somebody who who knows that they're supposed to keep the Shabbat day and refuse to do it. That is a sign of arrogancy and haughtiness, not a sign of meekness. So you can understand why the psalmist say the meek will he guide in judgment because he know with the haughty and the proud, hey, they're not going to listen to him, not going to follow him. That's why the Most High say, let them hear and let them forbear. Those that hear, okay, they're going to keep the law when you teach it to them. Those that forbear, they're going to ignore the law. So when you're dealing with somebody that's full of pride and arrogance and haughtiness, you don't have to argue with them. You don't have to come to blows with them. You just teach them and show them what thus says Yah and let them go. Because it's the meek that it says, Yah will guide in judgment and the meek will he teach his way. Do we understand how important it is to be humble? Do we really understand it? Because, you know, when I uh, have uh, taught before, I said the formula for keeping Yah's law is found in what? Psalms 37. Let's turn there real quick. It starts off by saying in verse number one, fret not thyself because of evil doers, neither be thou envious against the workers of iniquity, for they shall soon be cut down like the grass and wither as the green herb. Trust, number one, delight, number two, commit or commitment. And all of this is to Yah and his laws. Number five, uh, uh, and number five, which is number three, and rest patiently in Yah and wait for on him, not rushing to your own judgment. Number four. Well, look at this, and I want you to think about it. If you're haughty and you're prideful 
Are you going to do either one of these? Any one of these? You're not going to do it, right? Because it's impossible. You cannot submit yourself to Yah without delighting in his law. If you hate his law, just one little bit. If you could be swayed from his law, just one little bit. You're not humble. Because you're relying on yourself or someone else or something else to sustain you. Humility and humbleness are the same thing that go together. Haltiness and pride are the same thing that go together. If the Almighty say you shouldn't eat catfish because it doesn't have what? Fins and scales and all you can wait to eat when you go to Red Lobster someplace and order some catfish? Hey, is that humility or is that pride? That's pride. That's not being humble. To be humble is to lower yourself. To become low. To self-abase yourself. Like you're supposed to do on the Day of Atonement. Running up and down the streets and two or three miles from here to, to uh, uh, Lincoln Heights doesn't mean anything if you don't abase your spirit. If you don't humble yourself. If you don't get low. If you don't examine yourself. To see where you're standing at with the Most High. And being sorrowful for all the deviations and all the crimes that you've committed against the Most High. Yes, I'm all right. And arrogancy, it goes along with it. Being haughty and pride. Yes, sir. So we have to truly examine ourselves to see if we're truly as humble as we think we are. And believe me, most of us have come up short, at least sometimes. That's right, my sister said, if we're truthful. And if you're not truthful, that's not being humble. <laughs> that's not being humble. See, I, I remember at least you used to say, there's so many ways to be a fool that you can't miss them all. And sometimes we do hit and be a fool. And when we're doing that, when we're in that stage, we're not being humble. Let's look at what the Most High says about humble and being humble and what he thinks about someone that is humble. Because the scriptures is not just here for, we, for us to open up on the Sabbath day. It's for us to look at, to read, to understand the laws the statutes and the judgment, but also to measure ourselves by those that the Most High said was very close to him and holy to him. Before we do that, can anyone name at least two characters? In the scriptures that the most high favored because they were humble. Yes, sir, my brother. Meekest man on the face of the earth. Meekest man on the face of the earth. But why did he say that? We're gonna look at some things shortly. My sister said. His heart, okay, because he, he admitted his sin and he turned from it. And his heart, as the Most High said, was perfect towards him when he died. And we have to look at ourselves, as our heart perfect towards the Most High? If we died right now, could the Most High say that Ezekiel's heart was perfect towards me? Say, so yes, I know he transgressed, he did this and he did that. But could I say my heart was perfect against him? Towards him? Could you say it? 
Could anybody sit in these seats in the house of Israel? If you died right now, could the Almighty say that your heart is perfect towards him? And that's just a question for you to ask, for you to ask yourself. Because right now, if you say yes, you might be haughty. You might be showing some pride. What about Abraham? What about uh, Job? Let's look at Job. Now we're going to start at the first verse in the first chapter of Job. And it says, there was a man in the land of us whose name was Job. And that man was perfect and upright and one that feared, that feared Elohim and eschewed evil. And we know what eschewed mean, don't we? That he shunned evil. He stayed away from evil. But the key is that he feared who? Yah. So in order to fear Yah, he had to what? Humble himself. His substance also was 7,000 sheep and 3,000 camels, and 500 yoke of oxen, and 500 she-asses, and a very great household, so that this man was the greatest of all the men of the East, meaning in possessions, in wealth. Now, can you name a wealthy person in this land that has humbled himself to Yah? We're not talking about just doing some kind uh, feats here and there but has humbled himself truly to the most high. He's living a humble life. No. And this is an unusual thing. That's why out of all the men of the East, Job was mentioned. Job and his sons went and feasted in their houses every one his day and sent and called to their three sisters to eat and to drink with them. And it was so when the days of their feastings were gone about that Job sent and sanctified them and rose up early in the morning and offered burnt offerings. According to the number of them, all for Job said, it may be that my sons have sinned and cursed Elohim in their hearts. Thus did Job continually. He just didn't do it one day of the week or on the day of atonement. He did it consistently. And one thing that you don't see there either, what? Is that he took Almighty for granted. So he humbled himself and not only prayed for himself, but for his adult children that was out of the house because he knew that they may, they just may have cursed Yahweh in their hearts. How many of you pray for your children every day or your loved ones that is not with you every day? See, very few. Every day. And they said the Job did this every day. So this is definitely a man that is a humble individual 
and that he eschewed evil and that he worships Yah. Not himself. He's a very rich man. But he know from which cometh his help. He know from which he got the riches from. He knew that. So now there was a day when the sons of Elohim came to present themselves before Yah, and Satan came also among them. And Yah was saying to Satan, Whence comest thou? Then Satan answered to Yah and said, From going to and fro in the earth and from walking up and down in it. And Yah said unto Satan, Has thou considered my servant? Anybody want to put their name in that place? Huh? Or you just want to let Job stay there? Uh-huh. Wise. Wise. That's right. And why was Job mentioned? Because Yah knew him. Knew that he was a humble, the most humblest person on the face of the earth. He knew that he could stand up to Satan's advances. And just like y'all know new Job, he know each and every one of us. He know what is in our character, what is in our heart, what is in our spirit, what is in our mind. He knows that. And he knows that the majority of us will probably fail the test. Let's turn to ch uh, chapter 2. In Job chapter 2, and we're going to drop down to the fourth verse. Because hopefully most of you have read this. We're just going back over it to get to some reaffirmation. And Satan answered Yahweh and said, Skin for skin, yea, all that a man hath would he give for his life. And this is what we have to think of and consider. When we're being tested, when the man comes to you and tells you that, hey, if you don't eat this hog right here, this is all that you got to eat. And if you don't eat this, I'm taking off your head. Think about what are you going to say? Are you going to say, hey, if Yah doesn't save me, so be it. Or are you, master, I mean, you know, what, what about another day? I mean, taking off my head, how's it going to serve you? You know, every excuse for, hey, stand strong with the most high. Not my head, most, just, just my hand, you know. Why you want to start with my head? When your life is at stake, when your life is at stake, the strength that you thought you had, hey, you were looking for, where did that go? You know, I thought I was better than this, but man, you know, let me just get my feet up out of this sand, you know, like that monkey did in the signifying monkey album. You know, just when the lion knocked him with, the, or when he slipped and fell out of the tree, the lion was standing on with all four feet. He said, hey, just let me get, you know, what else? Up out of this sand. And that's what some of us would be doing. You know, the presser comes up on you and tell you, hey, you're going to eat this or you're going to die. Man, y'all understands. Y'all understands that you're not as strong as you thought you were that you're not as sincere as you thought you were. Because this law, the most high, is stronger than, or uh, should be strong to, to serve him in truth and in humbleness should be stronger than any desire to live. Because he wounds and he kills. He makes a lie. So 
See, many of us think that we're strong, but we really haven't been put to the test yet. Which reminds me of some brothers that go into the institution and they want to get, hey, they want to read the scriptures. They want to know about Yah. And they start studying and they got four or five years to study. And, hey, when they're inside, they can do no wrong. As soon as their foot hit that ground outside with all the temptations that was there when they left, then it's another individual. See, you haven't been put to the test yet, but the test is coming. The test is coming. Believe me, the test is coming. And if you're not humble, you're going to find yourself in a situation that you're not going to be able to stand up to. Yes, sir. Oh, I, I'm, I'm talking. Well, those that are strong enough know. Those that are not strong and in doubt, and they know who they are. But the almighty servants, his loyal servants and true servants, are going to stick with Yah. Those that are weak, because we have a lot of perpetrators. We have a lot of perpetrators in the nation of Israel. And only the strong survive. We, but we do. We have a lot of perpetrators. Those that, that are faking the funk, so to speak, hey, they're going to fail. They're going to fail the test. They are going to fail the test. No doubt about it. You know, there's one thing uh, in the scriptures where it says, Yah says, no weapon formed against you will prosper. But who is that talking about? Let's talk about the nation as a whole. The Almighty is not going to let this man destroy the whole nation. But you, if you're not strong with the Most High, then, hey, bye-bye. See, we think that the, that uh, uh, pertains to us. It only pertains to us if us is humbling ourselves and doing the will of the Most High. If us is not humbling ourselves, still walking around with a pride and haughtiness all day long and figure they can do or we can do the law whenever we get ready to do it, hey, that's not it. not going to be a part of but from let's see for just stop at fourth verse and Satan answered uh, Yahweh and said talking about Job skin for skin yea all that a man hath would he give for his life but put forth thine hand now and touch his bone and his flesh and he will curse thee to thy face talking about Job, he really didn't know who he was dealing with. Because this is going to the second test of Job. Satan had already tested him uh, one time and hey, he did, Job didn't budge. And Yahweh was saying unto Satan, behold he is in thine hand, but save his life. So when Satan forth from the presence of Yahweh and smote Job and sore balls from the sole of his foot unto his crown, he took him a pot share to scrape himself withal, and he sat down among the ashes. Then said his wife unto him, Dost thou still retain thy integrity? Curse Elohim and die. But look at Job's response. But he said unto her, Thou speakest as one of the foolish women speaketh. What? Shall we receive good at the hand of Elohim, and shall we not receive evil? And all this did not Job sin with his lips. So what is this saying? You know, you could be married to a, 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 a wife that is not as strong in Yah as you are. Because what affects you is going to affect her. And she might persuade you to turn your back on the Most High. And if you don't humble yourself to the most high, you would do it. If you don't humble yourself to the most high, you will do it. 
And too many times, you know, uh, brothers or our wives humbling themselves to their spouses rather than to the most high. That's why you see brothers dropping out of class, teaching that y'all, uh, you can't keep y'all's laws here anymore and the wife goes with them. Or a brother come in and he brings a wife in and the wife says you can't keep the laws anymore. You can't keep the laws in this land and she leaves and the brother leaves. So who are they humbling themselves to? It's not to the most high. Who have they made a deity out of? Themselves and the person that persuades them to follow them instead of the most high. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I, I know it. Right. Right. Yep. Yep. You're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. Let's look at Numbers uh, chapter 12 for, for a minute. Yeah, boy. Yes, sir. That uh, it, it, she does. But she, if you let her, she will. That's right. That is absolutely right. Let's start off with the first verse, and we've talked about Brother Moshe now. Uh, I'm sorry, Numbers chapter twelve, very first verse. And we're going to look, and I want you to look at all of these. Of patriarchs that we look at this afternoon. And the first verse says, And Miriam and Aaron spake against Moses because of the Ethiopian woman whom he had married. For he had married an Ethiopian woman. And they said, Has Yahweh indeed spoken only by Moses? Hath he not spoken also by us? Now, what was that a sign of right there? Pride, haughtiness, jealousy. I mean, that's right. I'm a prophetess. Hasn't he spoken by me? Had he spoken by me about this adventure? You marrying an Ethiopian woman? What gives you the right to marry an Ethiopian woman? And Yahweh spake suddenly unto Moses and unto Aaron and unto Miriam. Come out ye three unto the tabernacle of the congregation. And they three came out. And Yahweh came down in the pillar of the cloud and stood in the door of the tabernacle and called Aaron and Miriam. And they both came forth. And he said, hear now my words. If there be a prophet among you, I, Yahweh, will make myself known unto him in a vision and will speak unto him in a dream. My servant Moses is not so. Who is faithful in all mine house? You think Moses got to be the most faithful prophet in, in Yah's house by being arrogant, obnoxious, prideful, boastful? Huh? Did he get to be that uh, uh, to, to the Almighty Yah? By exhibiting those characteristics? No, no way. Said so with him will I speak mouth to mouth, even apparently, and not in dark speeches. Yes, sir. Aaron probably knew better. But you know, Miriam with some of our, our sisters, you know, they they speak, you know. 
especially, you know, sometimes out of turn and without the forethought, you know, they're just going to run off at the mouth, especially, you know, hey, you marry this Ethiopian woman, she's not a Hebrew. Well, hey, you know, where, where did Almighty give him the commandment that he couldn't marry Nowhere. And then she failed to realize. Or she realized she was just being haughty and arrogant, speaking against her brother. Because her brother, you know, like some of us think, somebody's in the limelight or getting the failed favors and everything. Hey, you know, we want to do everything we can to bring him down or to speak against him. Uh uh. The most I said, my servant Moses is not so who is faithful in all mine house. With him will I speak mouth to mouth, even apparently and not in dark speeches. And the similitude of Yah shall he behold. Wherefore then were we, were ye not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? And the anger of Yahweh was kindled against them, and he departed. Now, there's two things there. Just up until verse 9. Does anybody recognize what they are? Okay. One is, you haven't heard a mumbling word out of Moses' mouth, have you? You haven't, had it, haven't heard him to try to justify himself, to defend himself, to do anything. That's a sign of meekness. That's a sign of humbleness. He could have said, hey, I am Yah's chosen man to lead this nation. I am the one that Yah speaks to face to face and not in dark speeches. I am the one. I am the man. And for you, the best thing for you to do is sit back and, sh and be quiet, hold your peace unless a curse come upon you. He didn't say that, did he? Didn't open his mouth with one mumbling word of his own defense. And another thing that you say right here, what is the other one? Now, what's the other one? If you notice, Yahweh made a difference between his prophets and prophet says. He did not put them on the same what? Equal basis. He made a distinction between Moses, Aaron, and his sister, Miriam. So just because you have this, a title don't mean that you're on the same equal basis as someone else. And you may be carrying the same title. But on the humble, we realize that. See, humble and meekness goes a lot further than you think. But we got some brothers and sisters that think, hey, they don't have any title, but yet I can speak against the leadership. I can speak against the mores. I can speak against the elders. So we have to realize when we're being humble or when we're being obnoxious, when we're being prideful, when we're being arrogant. And the anger of Yah was kindled against them and he departed and the cloud departed from off the tabernacle and behold, Miriam became what? Leprous, white as snow. And Aaron looked upon Miriam, and behold, she was leprous. And Aaron said unto Moshe, Alas, my master, I beseech thee, lay not the sin upon us, wherein we have done foolishly, and wherein we have sinned. Let her not be as one dead, of whom the flesh is half consumed, when he cometh out of his mother's womb. And Moses cried unto Yahweh, saying, Heal her now, 
O Elohim, I beseech thee. What do you see about this, this, this meek brother? Compassion, forgiveness, mercy. He interceded on Mary's behalf. The one who's raising all the hell with him because he married an Ethiopian woman. He didn't open his mouth to defend himself. But when it came time to intercede on behalf of his sister, the one who was speaking against him, he did what? Just that. So how many of us in here are as humble as Moses? Good, nobody's lying. That's very important for us to know where we stand. Because see, I can raise my hand and say I am, but y'all knows. You can raise your hand and say you are, but y'all knows. Let's look at the, the 15th chapter of Numbers. Okay, let's start at verse number 30. Or should we move up? Uh, let's go up to verse 28, and we're going to come back down. And the priest shall make an atonement for the soul that sinneth ignorantly when he sinneth by ignorance before Yah to make an atonement for him and it shall be forgiven him. You shall have one law for him that sinneth through ignorance both for him that is born among the children of Israel and for the stranger that sojourneth among them. But the soul that doeth out presumptuously whether he be born in the land or a stranger the same reproacheth Yah and this soul should be cut off from among his people. So we know that you can't know a law and then go against the law without expecting certain results. And right here, the Most High said, for you do something presumptuously, meaning that you know what you're doing. You have considered the Sabbath day. You're working on the Sabbath day for you know that you're not supposed to. But you go ahead and did it anyway. Then he knows. He knows. And it said that soul shall be cut off. But let's go on down. 31st verse. Because he had despised the word of Yah and hath broken his commandment, that soul shall utterly be cut off. His iniquity shall be upon him. Now again. We talk about humbleness and humility. With that individual, where is the humility at? Where is the humbleness at? There is none. Oh, he gets humble when the Almighty puts the, the boom down on him. He becomes humble very quickly. But there's no humbleness, there's no humility with him when he's considering breaking the law and he chooses to break the law anyway. Because if he was humble, he said, no, I can't do that. Regardless of what the cost, I might lose a couple hundred dollars today or I might lose 500 or 1,000 today. Just depends on whether you're working for somebody or you in business for your own and your business is flourishing because of y'all. See, the humble considers everything. And he does 
Yah's wishes, not his own. When you find yourself doing your own will, your own wishes, then you know your humility has gone out the door. Yes, sir. That's right. Hey, to do what's wrong. And a lot of times they will succeed. They will succeed. You know? And that's a matter of fact. It's not our opinion. It's a fact. Let's look at the 32nd verse. And while the children of Israel were in the wilderness, they found a man that gathered sticks upon the Sabbath day. And they that found him gathering sticks brought him unto Moses and Aaron and unto all the congregation. And they put him inward because it was not declared what should be done to him. And Yahweh spoke and Yahweh said unto Moses, a man shall be surely put to death. All the congregation shall stone him with stones without the camp. But what is it that we don't see here? Huh? What is it that we don't see? Okay, by whom? Right, he didn't, he didn't say, well, here, uh, when, when they brought the man to him, he didn't say, well, take him over there. We're going to do X, Y, Z to him, did he? He said, no, put him in, and we will consult. I will consult with Yah to see what shall be done to that man. He did not take it upon his own. He did not say, again, I am the man that Yah chose. I will render judgment upon this man. Looked at the situation because the law had not been given to him or to any of the Israelites as to what to do in this circumstance. So he did not say. He checked with the Most High. What should we do with him? We don't have a law for this. We don't have uh, directions as to what to do when somebody gathers sticks on the Sabbath day. But the Almighty said, hey, you take him out and you stone him. He didn't say, well, I shouldn't be doing that. Y'all, I mean, can't you give him another chance? He didn't know. We didn't know what, hey. He complied with the Almighty's commandment. See, some of us want to be a little bit arrogant. You know, we say, well, hey, we know what to do. Let's take him on now. Oh, no, y'all, we can't do this to him. He didn't know. He didn't know. I know. It's a good brother. It's a good sister. We shouldn't do this with it. Okay. But we see what a humble man, the man of Yah, did. He looked and he said, hey, what should we do? When Yah spoke, that's what he did. He didn't say, we can't do this to him because he didn't know. I didn't know. Uh-uh. He did it. Let's look at... Uh, Let's go to Genesis. Chapter I want you to look at this. But again, look at it very closely because we're talking about humbleness and, hum and humility. And we're doing it with some of the most humble and the most highly esteemed patriarchs in the scriptures. Now we're going to deal with Abram, or Abraham. Chapter 12, first verse. So now Yahweh has said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation, 
and I will bless thee and make thy name great and thou shalt be a blessing and I will bless them that bless thee and curse him that curseth thee and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed so Abram departed as Yah has spoken unto him and Lot went with him and Abram was 70 and 5 years old when he departed out of Haran let's stop right there he's 75 years old 75 years old and he's been commanded by the most high to leave his land and his father's household and go into a strange land did Abraham show any haughtiness did he show any pride? Did he show any arrogancy? Did he even ask a question? Well, why is it that when we or anyone points out a law or a commandment in the scriptures, everybody has a question about it? Do we do it this way? Should we even be doing it? Why don't we do it? Well, I think we should do it this way. I think we should do it that way. Is it that we not as humble and meek as we think we are? You see, Abram was 75 years old. He was already an elder. 20 years over, 25 years over. And the Almighty spoke to him and gave him a directive. And he did not complain about it at all. He did not say, well, I'm too old to be traveling all over the, the globe right now. I mean, this is my home. This is my kindred. I don't know where you're taking me. Well, I don't know where I'm going. He listened to the Most High. And he accepted the directions of the Most High. And he left his father's house and his homeland and his kindred because this is what com uh, Yah commanded him to do. Let's go over here to the 13th verse of Genesis. And we're going to start here at the first verse. And this is still dealing with Abraham. And Abram went up out of Egypt, he and his wife, and all that he had, and lot with him, and to the south. And Abram was very rich in cattle and in silver and in gold. See the blessings that the Most High had blessed him with? Just like what we read about who? Job, the blessing that he had. You think they just came about because he was the most intelligent a farmer or whatever in the land of Nah or us? No. It's because of the blessings that the Almighty bestowed upon him. Because the Almighty knew his character, knew his, his spirit, knew who he was. And he depended on Job. He put Job out there to be a representative of him, to show him, to show Satan that, hey, I don't care if you've been running and down to and fro the earth. 50 times this is my servant here do what you want to except for taking his life and see where he will be he will still be steadfast with me now do we have that type of spirit we're looking at Abraham right now verse number 3 And he went on his journeys from the south even to Bethel to the place where his tent had been at the beginning between Bethel and Hai, until the place of the altar which he had, which he had made there at the first. And there Abram called on the name of Yah, and Lot also, which went with Abram, had flocks and herds and tents, and the land was not able to bear them, that they might dwell together, for their substance was great so that they could not dwell together. And there was 
a what? A strife between the herdsmen of Abram's cattle and the herdmen of Lot's cattle and the Canaanite and the Perizzite dwell uh, then in the land. And Abram said unto Lot, let there be no strife. I pray thee between me and thee and between my herdmen and thy herdmen. For we be what? Brethren. Is not the whole land before thee? Separate thyself, I pray thee, from me. If thou would take the left hand, then I would go to the right. Or if thou depart to the right hand, then I would go to the left. What does that show us about Abram? Huh? It was peaceful. What else? He was what? Meek. He had to be meek. I mean, he was a wise man. But you didn't hear Abram stand up and say, well, I'm your uncle. I'm your elder. You go over there in that land. And I will take this land. Or I will stay right here. He didn't do that. In his meekness, he gave his nephew his nephew, choice of any place that he wanted to go, any part of the land that he wanted, he gave it to him first. He just said, let that no strife be between me and thee, between thy herdman and my herdman. Meekness, humble. But he could have stood up and said, hey, you tagged along with me out of my father's house. Y'all called me, told me to go. You came along with me. Now this is what you got. You take that little piece of land over there and I got the rest. He didn't do that. He was meek and he was humble. Being one of us, we might have said, hey, brother. Hey. Moray told me that I could have this. So I advise you to find your own. You know, you go over there. You, get, you do this, you do that. I mean, we think that we're humble and we think that we're meek, but we really don't know what entails meekness and humbleness. We really don't know. We really don't understand it because it's more than just saying shalom, my brother, on the Sabbath day or shaking hands with my brother on the Sabbath day. It's more than that. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It's right amongst us. That's right. And that's right. I'm going to go my way. Yeah, you stay out of the way. You don't make it difficult for you and for them. <laughs> yes, sir. The And that's because we really don't know what being humble is, you know. We, we still have to learn how to be humble. You know? Let's look at uh, Daniel chapter 9. We're going to start at the 20th verse. And this is a great prophet, Daniel. And he is saying, And whilst I was speaking and praying 
and confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel and presenting my supplication before Yah, my Elohim, for the holy mountain of my Elohim. Yea, while I was speaking in prayer, even the man Gabriel, whom I have seen in the vision at the beginning, been caused to fly swiftly, touched me about the time of the evening oblation. And he informed me and talked with me and said, O Daniel, I am now come forth to give thee skill and understanding. At the beginning of thy supplications, the commandment came forth, and I am come to show thee, for thou art greatly beloved. And let's, let's stop right there. What did he tell Daniel? There was great beloved. So what does that say about humbleness and humility? Huh? Loves humbleness. Loves meekness. Loves humility. And if Yahweh loves it, what should we do? Any comments so far? On any verse? Any? Uh, praise the mighty Yah. Praise the mighty Yah. Mighty uh, Yah. Hallelujah. <clears throat> this subject is so deep. I've been meditating on this for so long. That's why I've been saying something about I don't remember Job, Daniel, and Noah. I keep trying to meditate on them. How Daniel can be in Babylon and be all the way up to the top rank and still hold on to his integrity and, and continue to serve Yah and fear Yah even to the death. You know, because... And I, I see some, I to some brothers not too long ago, and I was trying to, you know, say some stuff to them, some Hebrew brothers. But see, this humility, that's one of the main parts of that humbling and becoming meek. Because, see, we can find ourselves in certain situations to where uh, we might be in class, and it is done happen, where a leader or an elder or somebody might be speaking. But for Ariel, if my spirit gets offended and start feeling a certain way, then I have to start thinking about, so I have to say, hold on, hold on. I'm not on that level. I'm not on the right level. I'm not able to accept this humiliation uh, from this teacher or from this other brother. Or I'm not able to accept the humiliation from maybe my mother or my father or my wife. So then I got to start thinking like, it's something wrong with Ariel right now. You see, because it don't matter because somebody can look at me and say, Ari, I just see you downtown doing this and that, you wanna look at nothing Hebrew at all, bruh. And, and they go front on you in front of everybody. You know, and, and situations like that have came across my table even on my job, where your own brethren might front on you in front of everybody just to pull your card or whatever you wanna call it. But that was a time for me, you know, to see how I passed that test. You know, because Noah, Daniel, Moses, Abram, and it's different levels to it. The level Moses was on was a different level than what Lot was on. And I mean, Abram, Abram, Abram was on. Because Abram could have been like, you know, you know, whatever, you know, whatever you want to do, uh, you can roll with me and do what you want. You know what I'm saying? But that's not what he was on. But Moses was on that level to where he didn't even want nothing to happen to the person that was talking crazy to him. That was disrespecting him. Then that's where I'm trying to get my, my level on. Okay, you might disrespect me. We might disagree. I might have did something wrong. Then we can still go our separate ways. But and I'm going to set my humility for if it was something I've done wrong. And maybe you can set humility for if it was something you did wrong. But I was going to bring out the scripture right here in this verse. That humility, that goes, that goes way, way farther than what people think. 
if you if we can't accept a young person coming out the womb and I'm 36 born today and 10, 15 years later, I got to follow that child. We ain't on that level because if, if the almighty chose Joshua and he had Aaron, Miriam, all kind of other elders, all kind of people that studied the scriptures for a long time, you know, where the humility at? How, how can we even come together as a, a, a people if, as a people, we got our own decision on how things are supposed to be? It don't matter how I, I feel. It post, nothing don't matter how I feel. Because like you said, when they decided to do something, even when they being attacked on the Sabbath day, you know what they had to do? They had to inquire of Yahweh. So when we got laws, I'm going to look at this one here in Numbers 12. Real quick, I'm going to try to be real, real brief because this is something I've been meditating on a long time is that how can we become like babies again? You know, when you first came into the knowledge of the Most High, Yah, your mind was open. You was like happy like a little child with a little toy and everything. Next thing you know, you act like you 600 some years old. Like, oh, man, I know everything now. They over there, they wicked as can be. Well, that brother already got on the microphone and said something I agree with. That's a wicked brother right there, man. He just disagreed with how I see this about Yah. That's crazy. But Ariel going to continue to be Ariel, and he'll accept that humility. You feel me? Because that can help me become stronger as long as I don't waver from trusting in what Yah say. That's where the problem come about. You see, we're supposed to show that humility and that humbleness that meet us towards Yah. You know, and if I can't lower myself to base myself that low, and if you low enough, it ain't nothing nobody can do to offend you or, or hurt you. But Numbers 12, dealing with the, the prophet, the Almighty said that he will reveal himself to this person. I'm in Deuteronomy. Hold on a second. Let me see something real quick. Get the numbers real quick. Numbers, I think it's 12. Let me see. Because. Yep, 12 and 6, because this is, I got this new Bible I'm trying to get used to. It's a new KJ version. It's terrible. I'm telling you right now. It's a joke. But I'm about to hear it. Yeah. Uh, Deuteronomy 9 and 6 is what it said. All right. No, no, no. Is it 12? I'm in Deuteronomy still. Hold on a second. I, somehow I keep flipping past it. Yeah, let me use yours then. I'm, somehow I'm flipping past it. Yeah, uh, Numbers 12 and 6. And he said, Hear now my words. If there be a prophet among you, I, Yah, will make myself known unto him in a vision and will speak unto him in a dream. You know, and my point about this is we're uh, putting ourselves on that right level with Yah. We, we tend to uh, focus on other people in the world and what level they on. You see, I'm, I'm, I'm dealing with reality. I know when Almighty going to put a true prophet in my face. That's going to say, this is what y'all told me last night. For real deal. And I'm, 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 I'm y'all going to allow us to know the truth if you dealing with a true prophet or not. And people can feel however they want to feel about what REO is saying right now. Okay, I'm just, I'm just gonna put that out there because this is this is something right here that's dealing with humility and, and, and learning how to accept certain things. Whether it's that that baby at home that we just had grow up to lead a people that here it is, my wife has to learn how to somewhat submit to that baby that can't hold his head and nothing. You gotta, you know what I'm saying? But we not like that with Yahweh no more. We not like that. So on this twenty, I'm gonna if I can show this one last thing about the heart. Well, yeah, let, about. Me, let me let me just stop you right now, and then we'll before we close out, we'll have an, another opportunity. But you know what you're saying is, is 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 basically true. We don't we don't submit ourselves to what the Most High says. See, like I think it was who was it that the well, like if if, if a mule, if a if a donkey, if a German shepherd come up and say and tell you what thus says Yah, then you listen to him. Simple as that. You don't go about one